two. Can you believe it? It's the 83rd episode of Wayne's World and Kelly. And today, our special guest is Will Delgado, the COO, that's right, COO, Chief Operating Officer of a company called Castle Group, um, which I think y'all just went over 3,000 employees. Is that correct? Uh, not quite yet, uh, Kelly, oh. but we're, we're getting very close. We're getting very, very close. So first we should say we're hiring. Being you, not us. We are too. We right? are. We are. We're a much always... smaller company. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we appreciate it. Good people. We've been trying to get you on the schedule here until we finally accomplished it. But you're in Naples, so it's even double thank you for uh, you know setting up over before you head to a bunch of meetings and doing all the things that COOs do. But um, you know, we always try to get unique, special people on the show. And you've got quite a diverse career, so we're really excited to have you on. So as opposed to Wayne or I introducing you and telling you our elaborate biography, take a couple of minutes and just kind of tell us a little bit about Will. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, Kelly, Wayne, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. And uh, Kelly, I, I know we tried, uh, gosh, at least three times and uh, to schedule conflict, so appreciate the patience as well. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm originally from the Northeast, uh, born in New York City, raised on the Jersey Shore, the famous Jersey Shore. Uh, came to Florida about 20 years ago, and that's uh, well after my original career. I was an Army officer uh, right after college. Went to Rutgers University, went through the RTC program, then went on active duty for a number of years. Uh, last assignment, I came out of Baghdad, uh, came to the great state of Florida, uh, lived here in Naples first, um, was over here for seven and a half years. That's when I got into real estate development. I worked for a company that was rather large at the time called WCI. I uh, was in their tower division, building uh, luxury condos right on the water here in uh, the Colony Golf and Bay Club in the Stero. Beautiful views, luxury buildings, uh, had a lot of fun doing that. And then uh, I got introduced to this guy named James Donnelly who is the uh, chairman and founder of Castle Group through a mutual friend, happened to be looking for a guy who could run a tower division uh, with a, you know, appropriate background. And so uh, we met, uh, worked out really nice. Uh, about a month later, I was coming over to uh, where our home office is in Plantation doing a tour. Met uh, Craig Vaughn, our CFO, Rob Donnelly, who was then our COO, James's younger brother. Um, the rest is history. I've uh, been affiliated with the company now for 12 years. Wow. So that's quite a history. I, I knew about your military. And I didn't know about Baghdad. So that's that's pretty intense. And and, and thank you for your service without, uh, I don't sound like redundant, but really that what a what, what, what an incredible way to start out your career and and, and glad you're still here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Kelly, I, uh, I started off as an infantry officer. So uh, my first assignment, I go to uh, the 7th Infantry Division, which is in Monterey, California. And I'm, uh, I've got an apartment on the beach. I'm a single guy. I'm living a great life. I'm going, wow, this, this Army life's okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> my next assignment, I was about four feet from North Korea along the DMZ. Uh, oh, wow. With the 506, which is the unit from uh, Band of Brothers, you know, the uh, the Kurdi battalion. So right. I was with those guys. It was an air assault battalion uh, in about as far north uh, in South Korea as you could get before crossing into actual North Korea. Uh, that was a bit of an eye opener as to what the real world looked like and what the real army looked like. Wow. Um, and uh, so, you know, a couple of different assignments around the country it was at uh, Fort Stewart in Georgia. Uh, was in Germany for a bit, um, and a little fun fact there, uh, the unit, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, the base I was at, is the same one where Elvis was. I was so hoping when, you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> when you went to the barbershop there, they had tons of pictures of Elvis, you know, all those famous pictures you've seen of Elvis when he first got his hair cut. Uh, right. They, uh, when they had him joined way back in the day. And, uh, and from there, we had deployed to Baghdad back when uh, the Iraq war first kicked off. And this is obviously the second version of that one. So I was there from um, 03 to 04, a uh, pretty long period of time uh, to be, you know, with uh, car bombs going off around you, active insurgency, um, lots of stuff to see there. But, um, you know, the 
one thing I can always say is that uh, America has the best soldiers. Got a lot of young men and women who really give their all. Uh, I right. don't think the average civilian understands that unless they have a family member or someone related to them that is serving uh, what the level of sacrifice is that those young men and women endure whenever they're deployed. So I got, um, Bob, I, I, I get get 33 years, well, did 33 years in the army. So you saw the world one foot at a time. He saw it one track at a time, but you know, <laughs> and there's, and there's, you know, there's millions. And that's my only regret is I didn't join the military and I probably should have, but Let's not ignore the fact that the, not the cushy ones like Monterey, what a <laughs> assignment that is, but yeah. where you were in other places that prepared you to work with condominiums. <laughs> and it's well, so you know, I, I got to tell you, Kelly, so when I, um, when I left the military, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do, but uh, back during that time frame, anybody who was a, an officer, at least, you, know, you had a ton of leave, which is, you know, the military equivalent of vacation time and it would accrue and so when I left I had you know about an entire quarter's worth of time wow. um, and so I was introduced to uh, the gentleman who would eventually become my division or was my first division president when I went to WCI through a friend of a friend and you know he was looking at me and said well you have no experience in construction none in real estate development but the reason they hired me is because I had managed large teams, lots of money, uh, and, and all of that's a transferable skills, right? Uh, when you can handle a large budget, a large team, keep everybody on track, uh, you know how important it is, Kelly, in the uh, construction world, on time, on budget, right? That's always your, your guideline there. Absolutely. So, uh, prior to getting out of the Army, I was uh, a battalion operations officer, uh, which is... A, similar to being a COO, uh, and then followed that by being a battalion executive officer, which again, very similar, uh, although you have some different uh, specialized individuals who work under you. So I took that knowledge, applied it to real estate development, and it was you know very similar. In fact, I went to lunch with my division president uh, about a month in, and he said, you made a really nice transition. Tell me what you did. And I told him that I just put things into terms I understood. And so my general contractor, you know, on a job site who has a couple of hundred folks, I said, it's just like my infantry battalion. And my architects, my engineers who all have a very unique skill set, that's just like what in the military you call slice elements. And those guys are like your artillery guys, the combat engineers. They only bring that one skill set to the battlefield. So it was really just a matter of synchronizing those guys to, you know, for the common good. In this case, it was the completion of a beautiful tower and helping deconflict whenever things came up. So Kelly, I know you're very familiar with the construction world. You know, when, uh, when some unknown condition presents itself in the field, what do you do? You gotta get the team together again, right? Take a look at it, come up with the best solution. And that means both in practical matters as to how you're actually going to build something as well as uh, from a budgetary perspective, you know, when that change order comes back to the developer, is it acceptable or not for the project budget? So everything was very similar to what I had been doing in the past, and I really took to it. Just without the car bombs. What does? Yeah, you know, uh, it's uh, there's a whole different viewpoint of what. Uh, Are we frozen? <laughs> well, no, the toughest thing you got to worry about first building one. Uh, that's a. Uh, that's nothing compared to, uh, you know, when you're kind of dodging uh, some bullets every now and then, grenades, <laughs> et cetera. So. Some similarities. So, so talk about talk about the transition just a little bit more, Will, as someone that's seen combat. And then and then you come and, you know, reenter into back into, you know, corporate America, start building, a, you know, rebuilding a career and everything. Um it seems the way that you've done that is you, you know, you, you, you've applied the skills that you learned into the military. Was it a really tough transition for you? And when, when you, when you were going through what you did and then you come back into the mainstream, was it, was it difficult? Did you kind of shake your head? Like, you know, these people think they have problems here with everything that's tearing America apart. And here you are on the front lines and you're, you're, 
you're back to work, you're building a crew, you're building a company, you're taking care of your family, you're doing all these things. How, do, how does that change you? It, it, it had to have changed you probably a lot. Yeah, you, you know, Wayne, you have to, you have to adapt, right? Uh, in any situation. But I'll, I'll tell you, part of it, you just kind of keep to yourself. Like when you, yeah. when you're working with some folks and they're um, talking about certain things and, you know, you've got that perspective of like, you have no idea. You have no right. idea. I mean, you're, you're complaining, you're pissing and moaning about whatever it may be. But the reality is uh, the moment you step out of that office, that situation goes away versus you're in a combat zone. Okay. The moment you step out of a room, you're, you know, potentially uh, at greater risk of, you know, being hit by something. So it's not quite the same. But I, I would tell you this, one of the adjustments that I had to make, um, I was used to being extremely busy. Okay. Uh, I used to have at any given time about 45 different tasks that I was tracking across the staff that I was running. And that did not include anything that would happen. And by anything that would happen, I mean, something like if a car bomb goes off in, in your sector, you got to go react to it completely unplanned, of course. But I was ex used to being very, very busy. Uh, you know, when you're in a combat zone, there's no such thing as a weekend. There's no such thing as a holiday. You're working seven days a week. Most of the time, it was 18 hours a day. Uh, sometimes there were at least three episodes where I went, you know, 36 hours straight because of necessity. Um, and so I remember I went to my division president after being on the ground uh, in my new job for about 90 days. I literally went to his office and I said, uh, his name was Stefan. And I said, Stefan, is there anything else I can do for you? Because, uh, you know, I had my one project. It was in the early stages. We were doing uh, the piles for the foundation. And if you've been on a tower job site, you know, there's, there's not a whole bunch to do as for the project manager at that point in time when the, the rig is just drilling those piles and they're going in. You're really just counting those down until they're done and you can uh, begin all the other work. And uh, he looked at me and he said, I've literally never had anybody come to me and ask me that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I had to downshift uh, because I was used to this intense pace. And, um, you know, it's funny because uh, my family was saying, you know, we're not used to seeing you with like, you know, not a hundred things to do because a lot of times in the military, even when I was back in garrison and at home, there was something to do. And so it was a very distinct shift uh, towards lesser work. Uh, it does clearly prepare you as you move up our corporate ladder, so to speak, when you're gaining greater responsibility and, and then getting back towards that same workload. Uh, so that helps. Um, and, you, and Wayne, to answer the other part of your question, you do have to have a mind shift about you're clearly not in the military anymore. You know, in the military, a lot of times the attitude is go get it done. Right. That's what we do. We go get it done. Nothing stops us until we're done. And a lot of times there's, you know, you, you hear about this when you're in the military, but you eventually start to experience it uh, outside of it where there's, you know, it's office politics in certain places. There's bureaucracy about uh, getting things done. And you're so used to, I could have had that done three days ago. Guys, why are we still talking about this? Right. You're used to very decisive leadership. There is no quibbling. Um, you just go get it done. So that takes an adjustment too. You, the, the pace of change is definitely slower uh, when you're trying to get something done. Yeah, that's uh, the, the part that I like in the beginning when you were explaining it was like, there's some things that you had to com compartmentalize and put away from when you're on the mean streets and the, you know, in Baghdad, and then, you know, yeah. you, you transition back into, in a lot of the stuff that's you know, America, you know, we, we like to fight, you know, and it's just every day. It's just like, can we all get back to work, please? And kind of the part that I want to focus on with you is like, when you saw what you saw, and then you come and see this stuff that we're all fighting about, just pick a pick, pick something. You must be like, really, really? I mean, this is yeah. really it, what we're fighting about. You know what I mean? Yeah. dude? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Wayne, lots of eye rolls at times, right? When uh, I go, guys, that's really not important. It's really right. not. No, it's not. <laughs> you know? No, it's uh, not. When, when, uh, it's when not. people are quibbling over, 
certain vocabulary, right? And I go, seriously, that that is what is important in your world right now? Because to me, you. it doesn't mean a hill of beans, you know? Nope. Yeah. So yeah, there, there are times, that, you know, for things like that. I mean, I, uh, I have said to people, you know, in America, we have, um, we have poverty, right? But I have told people because of other places I've been, I said, we have the richest poor people on the planet. Yeah. And yep. a lot of, a lot of folks here would say, oh, that's, that's just cruel. That's, you know, insensitive. Yep. And I, uh, I was in the Philippines doing a lot of work at one point. And if you've ever been in the Philippines, it doesn't take long before the poverty that you see in certain areas really starts to get to you. Okay. Because when you see the uh, five-year-old taking care of the two-year-old because both mom and dad have to go to work and mom and dad are making two bucks a day just to feed the family. And I look at, you know, folks in our country and there's plenty of opportunity and the difference is the opportunity, right? Because so you can do things here. There are ways, there are means to get to it. If you are part of the poor class in the Philippines, there's no such thing. It is, you're going to scrape by, you know, you might get lucky on, on uh, doing something else, but there's no such thing as grants to go to college. There's no such thing as the social welfare programs we have that will help prop you up. You know, so I look at our folks and I say, well, you may not be living as high of a standard as, you know, some other folks who are doing well and, and have a steady income, but you're not living at that same level like that. And right. um, uh, there was one period I was in the Philippines for 39 days straight. And I tell you, it just starts to starts to get to you seeing that, you know, constantly. Uh, there's only so much you can do in terms of trying to compartmentalize it and keep it in the back yeah. of your head, stay focused on why you're there in the first place. Uh, but uh, you know, I think a lot of our folks, um, and I mean, the average American citizen, I really wish they would travel to certain areas and see this for themselves, because it gives you a whole different perspective about what uh, what it really means to be poor and what opportunity looks like in our country and how you can take advantage of it and do whatever you like. I, I'm a firm believer that uh, in this particular country, you can do anything you like. You've got to work for it. Nobody's going to hand it to you. You can do anything you like. But it just so we're you really were four feet away today, from the Will is announcing kingdom. his run for Congress. I want to <laughs> vote for you right now. <laughs> hey, let me transition you know, and I'll let Wayne come back. But let me let me jump in for a minute. Uh, it's no secret I used to work for uh, the great Don Kip, Donald Kibnis, who was a legend in construction in South Florida. And I remember one day I said to him, hey, I went by XYZ property and they want to engage with us on providing our services. And he says, I built that building. So my question to you, Will, is have you been to any, are you all managing any of the buildings that you were part of building back in the day? And if not, why not? Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're not. And uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Laura Bryan, our sales gal here in Southwest Florida. <laughs> because, I'll throw uh, Laura on the bus. We love her. <laughs> no, love, love Laura too, Kelly. Uh, it's funny, uh, just this weekend. So my in-laws, um, they're retired and they are in Naples. And so this past weekend, I was also here. We spent some time with them and we were out on the water for a bit. But I was showing my mother-in-law. I said, you see that building? You know, I said the, the first one out of the four, yes. And then the fourth one, yes. I said, I built those two. <laughs> so oh, uh, there's always a certain amount of pride uh, when you've been involved in a project like that. Now, clearly, you know, not just me, there were a couple of hundred folks who worked on that, but it is fun to be able to say and to show, uh, you know, my kids, uh, hey, I, I, uh, I built that thing. I got a lot of pride that it's there and it still looks great. You know, that's, um, that is something special. You know, because sure. you know it's going to be for a very long time. I think we need to give Laura a list, and maybe uh, she can get started on that. Because I think that'd be great. Uh, I'm going to tell her. <laughs> you know, it's part of her sales goal for this year. That's right. <laughs> and I and I and I, and I, and I want you know a little bit of credit. But uh, so you mentioned your kids, and I know you have one up in Georgia going to school. So yeah. tell us uh, tell us how how they're doing and how that's reflected on your on your careers. Yeah. So my, uh, my daughter is a freshman, University of Georgia, uh, so go dogs. Uh, I happen to be a dog fan well before she ever got there, so this works out very well. Um, 
but she's doing great, Kelly. She is what's called a foundation fellow scholar. Uh, it is the, I, I'm, this is a proud dad moment. Um, she is one of only 30 kids who uh, wins that scholarship each year. Very Thanks. prestigious. And in fact, right now she is, um, she's flying to DC. They were in New York. This is actually their spring break. But for the freshman class, they have an annual New York City, DC trip. Uh, what I love about this program is they expose these kids to just a ton of different people. A lot of it has to do with the alumni of that program. She told me the other day they were meeting with some vice presidents of Citibank. Uh, they're going to meet with the Spotify, uh, I believe it's CFO, all wow. who are alumni of this program. So the, today is the transition day, the flying to D.C. They'll continue their whole tour. Um, this summer, as part of also the freshman year, she's going to go to Oxford. And uh, she gets a couple of weeks there as part of the program. And, you know, uh, so dad loves this because one, the exposure to the prestige of the program and the uh, reach of the alumni once she becomes a graduate. And three, uh, it isn't costing me anything. So that's even better. <laughs> I mean, don't I'm forget jealous number right now. <laughs> number four, hopefully during spring break, she'll be doing cake stands. So that's, you know, I, I had, you know, I, I had a daughter in college who's now graduated. Wayne has a son who's a sophomore, as he mentioned. So, you know, there's all those, all I, I look back at my college career and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> please don't yeah. duplicate that. Sounds like she's doing a better job following your footsteps of um, always looking for something more to do. And that's fantastic. Well, she, uh, she's a fantastic kid, um, self-motivated. You know, um, I've always uh, coached the kids about, you know, preparing their high school resume, you know, for college and everything. And they've always followed my guidance, sometimes with, you know, needing a little nudge, most of the time not. And it's really worked out well. Uh, so my my daughter, Gabby, who is at home, she's a senior in high school. She's now in decision making phase. Um, she has done very well herself. She's been accepted uh, everywhere she applied. So she, she batted a thousand on acceptances. And it's nice. down to University of Georgia as well, where she could join her sister, uh, and UF, which uh, I think she may be leaning towards too, because uh, her bestie uh, is likely to go there too. So uh, we we're not putting pressure on her. We you know basically said uh, we'd be happy with either one. All right. Uh, take your time here a little bit, evaluate it a little more. Going to take her up there to do another trip through uh, through UF up there in Gainesville. She's already been through Athens a bunch of times because of other trips we've made into Georgia and seeing her sister when she got started. So uh, we'll see where we land. So have you have you exposed her to REM music? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you got to remember, Kelly. I, I grew up with REM, man. That's my uh, that's my genre when I was in college. Are you kidding me? Right. Athens, Georgia. Just, just a little bit yeah. after me. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> I still funny. Loved we, it. we, uh, we did have to explain to uh, to Bella, my my daughter, who's at Georgia. We did have to explain uh, the whole background of Athens and REM. Uh, so, but she gets it now, of course. In That's, fact, you she, know. Sent, she sent a photo. Uh, the uh, the lead singer was roaming around Athens uh, not too long ago, and uh, of course, it makes news every time you know he's spotted and everything. But uh, no way. Yeah, there was a picture taken of him in like a local record shop or something when he was just kind of cruising around town. Very oh, cool. wow. I mean, our REM, you know, played a huge part, I guess, in our musical catalog when I was in college, you know, even even in high school. My probably my top five night swimming, I think it is that's in my top five. That song just like just sears your soul, man. I I love that song. Wayne, I was a uh, I was an alt rock kind of guy all through college. right here too so, right so uh you know rem the smiths uh the cure that was all that was all me psychedelic oh, furs i i i, <laughs> I loved all of all, all of the alternative rock was was like um you know like nirvana smashing pumpkins pearl jam stone temple pilots sonic youth i mean i could go on and on and i'm sure will could too but that's that was our generation generation x that's why i always give kelly a lot of a lot of crap about his baby boomer like the beatles and the stones and like just kill me now will and i our music man we rule dude <laughs> wait wait i love i was throwing out a bunch of names too i loved all that stuff too i didn't stop with my older brothers and sisters music but i still think you know, the beatles are the greatest ever 
I know, no, dude. I just like giving you crap about when, it. Uh, I just. Wayne, I was in California when uh, Stone Temple Pilots, um, you know, Pearl Jam, all those guys were coming oh. out big. And they were, you know, they were just north of California. So that was uh, that was big. At the same time, it's funny. At the same time, and I was just talking about this the other day to someone. At the same time, that's when um, West Coast rap was big, too. And Snoop yes. Dogg was first coming out on the scene and everything. West Coast versus <laughs> East Coast. I mean, yeah. that, that yeah. whole that whole time in music you know i mean whatever anybody thinks about nirvana the one part that no one can argue with was they completely destroyed the hair metal groups in the 80s they okay. came on and, and it was like an atomic bomb and when it happened it was like holy you know what this, this is really happening and unfortunately when he died that's when alternative rock seemed to have died too Right. I mean, what what came after that? Hootie and the Blowfish. I mean, come on now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Come on. Don't be <laughs> busting on Hootie. Love Darius Rucker. But, but let me just get arrested so a think about ago. it. Let's that? bring this all together, guys, because this is basically a music um, podcast. I love how we got here somehow. But you mentioned rap, right? Run DMC resurrected yep. Aerosmith. And they were back right. in they the did. game after the spilt yeah. milk for, you know, to today. So absolutely yeah. they were. No, that's a good point. That is a really good point where you have the co-mingling of different genres of music. Right. I mean, I remember when that happened, dude, Aerosmith was dead. They were dead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Oh, they, they were living on like their, their manager's couches and they were broken up after the fight over the milk being thrown at the wives. I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's amazing. So <laughs> things can turn around. You know, I prefer Will's lifestyle of doing all great things in life. But when you look at Steve and, and his drug, I mean, these guys were doing heroin and now they're in their mid mid to late 70s, still 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 rocking out. I mean, you know, only in America still, still survive after that horrendous lifestyle that those guys led. But, uh, you know, and I, I believe in uh, hundredth chances, you know, for the ones that do fail. You know, you, Will's talking about the people in um, the Philippines. Our church up in Virginia, uh, Park Valley Church, had had uh, a program in, a, in churches over in the Philippines. And we sent boots over to to men that would go into a dump that was, you know, three deep, th uh, what, three feet of um, sewage. And they were pulling stuff out of there all day to try to make a couple pennies for their family. I mean, you yeah. know, Will, you hit it spot on. I mean, anybody that can do traveling and find out how life is makes the rev you know, makes you motivated for the rest of your, of your life to, you know, not only help those people, but to help yourself and not make those bad decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I Amen, think it's brother. all about perspective. You know, a lot of folks who uh, don't appreciate things, it's because they've never seen what it looks like without it, honestly. Yeah. Right. Well, it's nice right. to and, see. And, it's nice to see Will, where you have done all this stuff, but you also have great passion for music, and obviously passion for your daughters, which I can relate to. And um, and, and and Wayne and his son. Oh my God, forget about it. But you know, and it's, I, you know, it's it's a good human aspect for people to to, to see of you know of because I mean you're a big company leader, and and you know you probably don't like to hear it, but you know you're 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 an inspiration to a lot of people. And, and I, I, I remember when I first met you, I'm like, oh, this guy was definitely in the military. You know, <laughs> you, you just have that stature about yourself. And then, you know, I remember asking you and, and you told me you served in the army. I think I bored you about Bob Akin after that. Um, but um, I, I just, I think it's, it's great for you to, to show all these different things in such a short period of time. So, so where are you off to next? Uh, I'm actually off to, I have to do, uh, I'm helping Laura. So we're not throwing Laura under the bus. We're helping Laura today. Uh, I'm actually going to a, a high rise round table that's going to be done uh, at Tiburon. So I'm going to go a little bit south of where I'm at right now. Uh, join her. Uh, we've got some others who are going to uh, partake in a panel discussion. Uh, I know we have a number of our existing castle customers who are attending, uh, which is always great to reconnect with them. And then uh, some new folks uh, probably interested in hearing what we have to say. And uh, as you can imagine, Kelly, it's a lot of about uh, SIRS, uh, all of the various inspections. How do we handle these uh, mounting expenses on the condo side, right? That's a 
sure. really big challenge for all of us right now between uh, insurance cost, reserving for the structural components, which is about to become law, uh, as well as uh, all of those other things you need to get done, like ELSS and BDA, if you are an older property. Absolutely. And it's uh, people really need to pay attention to ELSS because it's a lot less expensive than going full board if they if they delay. So yeah. hope people are yeah. listening. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're out there sharing that information. You know, we're you know, we're always looking to do what's best for our client, as you guys are, too. And sometimes they'd say, always think, oh, they're just doing a sales pitch. And it's like, you know, it's it's a lot to take on. These people have to spend a lot of money. But at the end of the day, we have to we have to make our building safe and we have to kind of clean up the mess of the past. Of A lot of it was with with lack of reserves in Florida. Um, great marketing and business move for the, you know, for the for the state, but not so good when you have the ramifications of of not taking care of your buildings, not having the money in reserve, but yeah. Well, yeah. All that deferred maintenance that folks pat themselves on the back with, uh, you know, we kept our budget to a certain level. It's coming yeah. home to roost, isn't it? Yep. Oh, yes, it, it is. is. And it's, and it's, and it's pay the piper time. And, you know, and, and the best thing they can do is just go at it methodically, you know, and plan, you know, plan, 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 plan. Obviously in the military, that's, all you guys did. You guys, when y'all did something, it was well thought out and you got the war college and everything. And now it's war on protecting people in their buildings. And um, so I'm glad you're yeah, that's, always, uh, that's always my mantra when I'm talking uh, our folks through this. It's, God, it's all about a good plan. Yeah. And that plan has both the financial aspects to, uh, as part of it, of course, as well as assembling a good team. You need a solid engineer. You need a good attorney who's going to, you know, um, protect you on, on all of these contractual matters. Uh, you likely need a project manager who is, you know, we talk to our boards and virtually none of them have construction experience, right? right? So why not bring in, yes, it will cost you some additional money, but why not bring in a good project management team who knows that language, who knows that world, who will protect your interests on a week in, week out basis as that project progresses. And you know that message has been coming home or being well more well received nowadays, uh, with a lot more of our customers when they see the extent of the work that's to be done. And that wasn't a planned pitch, but to, as an owner and as owners rep project managers, we always say with critical thinking, and that's yeah. what we have. You know, doing a pitch for my companies, we have some guys and women with great experience that do the critical thinking. And but regardless of every wherever you are and where you're doing it. Scope definition is the most important thing. You need to be able to figure out everything that has to happen for a successful outcome. And if you don't, it can hit you in the wallet really bad. So, yeah, and I, I like talking about music better. I still think the Beatles. <laughs> are. Hey, I know you got to get off. We all got fun stuff to do. We really appreciate that we finally got to connect. Now, I, I, we always say, well, we got to get you back on because there's so much more to talk about. But um, definitely appreciate your time. Have a, you know, I hope sunshine will come over there in the afternoon. Yeah. Are you going to be there for the sunset? No, no, I, uh, I'll head back to our coast till, um, right after I'm done with um, this event. So should be back uh, on our side by uh, the late afternoon. Are you going to hit? Well, the thank you very much, uh, Wayne Kelly. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. This was fun. Yeah, <laughs> tell Laura that we said hello. I uh, talked to her last week. I was at your educate. Uh, to elevate last week and, yeah. and so was Kelly yeah. and, and, and really enjoyed it. But um, I'm looking forward to talking to you again sometime, sir. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks guys. Have a great day. Take care, brother.